moderator for this webinar. We are presenting with Horizon today, Automating Immunohistochemistry Standardization in Your Laboratory. We have presenting with us Martin Christensen, who is with Visio Farm, and he is a Director of Sales and a Project Manager for us, and also with our partnering company, Horizon, Farah Patel, who is also a Product Development Manager at Horizon. So before I turn the presentation over to Farah, um, let me just briefly introduce our two speakers. As I mentioned, Farah is a Product Development Manager, and she is currently leading the IHC Fish and RNA Reference Standard Product Development Program at Horizon Diagnostics. Farah works closely with a broad range of European North American quality assurance schemes, leading pathologists and reference laboratories with the goal of driving the standardization of IHC assays across the globe. Farah holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge in Cell Cycle and a postdoctorate in Muscle Stem Cell Biology from the National Center of Biological Sciences. And Martin Christensen has been with our company, Visio Farm, since 2011, where he has worked in various aspects of our organization, including technical support, professional services, and as an application scientist, and most recently as a director of sales uh, with Digital Pathology. His expertise is in project management, and he was a key component in initiating our BizioPharm clinical validation projects, and is continuously working to support our pathology laboratory customers in the transition of digital pathology, um, including on-site validation projects covering image analysis for diagnostics. He received his master's in biomedical engineering from the Technical University of Denmark in 2011, specializing in signal and model-based diagnostics combined with image diagnostics and radiation physics. In 2014, he achieved his project management uh, uh, certification at the Copenhagen Business Academy and his equivalent of an IPMA certification. All right, I will turn it now over to Farah to start the presentation. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Amanda. For the introduction and thank you all for joining us today. Immunohistochemistry has evolved from an investigative tool in a, into a widely used diagnostic technique. IT serves as a diagnostic and prognostic assay and in a clinical setting it increasingly contributes to the choice of treatment. Although it has been employed for over 50 years, the application of this method suffers from a lack of standardization and reproducibility among different laboratories. IT standardization is indispensable for consistent and reliable results. Today, Martin and I will be taking you to talking to you about variability arising in a typical IT workflow and challenges facing the clinical pipeline. Most importantly, Martin will present how we have used quantitative digital pathology from VisioFarm and Horizon's genetically defined negative and positive IT reference standards to assess the concordance between manual and automated IIT scoring in cell lines and tissue obtained from the BRAF V600E external quality assurance run led by the Canadian Immunohistochemistry Quality Control in Canada. This work was done in collaboration with the CIGC. So one very important question for all of us doing any IIT testing, be it a laboratory in a hospital, or an assay development team in a biotech company or a pharma company or a CRO is what is the impact of assay failure in your lab and how do you monitor for it? Where can variability, variability creep into a standard IIT workflow? Many factors during the pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical phases affect the final results. Currently, the methods cannot be fully standardized. Individuals and labs must make choices concerned concerning each parameter during the three phases. There are several published parameters, recommendations, and guidelines that support and guide laboratories, but many critical issues remain. This slide highlights a typical workflow in an IC laboratory from sample preparation to analysis. The first challenge starts right at the beginning of the process with differences in sample collection heterogeneity and fixing. Different labs follow different protocols for sample preparation and these can both influence the downstream results such as intensity of staining and tissue morphology. 
the, the second challenge relates to thickness of accuracy of the section scut. We all know that different section thicknesses can result in different staining intensities and therefore consistency is very important. However, it is very difficult to monitor um, how each laboratory cuts their sections and uh, how that would affect a staining result. Selecting the optimal analytical method for the IC assay can be challenging. As I'm sure you all know, when performing IC assays, labs use various staining kits, antibodies, and automated staining platforms, and all can result in a different staining in different staining results. In the case for an antibody, the choice of the primary antibody is very important, and, and specifically the titer. Let's take BRAF B600 detection in colorectal cancer as an example. From our external studies and from data from collaborators, we know that laboratories are today finding it very difficult to optimize the BRAF B600E antibody IFC assay. And many suggest that the antibody might not be sensitive enough. However, we also know that a lot of these laboratories are not utilizing or not going through these protocols step by step and are not following the manufacturer's instructions. So the question is, who is right and who is wrong? And how can we improve these assays? And how do we monitor these assays? Next, we come to the accuracy of quantification and, and, and interpretation. Today, we most pathologists use the microscope as an, and a readout and uh, what is the level of brownness in, uh, in a slide. And um, how accurate and how accurate is that scoring method, especially for biomarkers that do not have official scoring guidelines? Have you considered using quantitative digital pathology to quantify the intensity of staining and thereby monitor consistency of your assays? Finally, what external on-site controls do you use to monitor your assay? Are they easy to find? Is it a finite source? Are they consistent day on day, year on year? Monitoring for these variabilities is important, not only in a clinical laboratory, uh, such as a hospital or a reference laboratory, but also in a clinical development pipeline. And that brings us to the challenges facing the clinical pipeline. Here, I, uh, what we've done here is we've segmented it into three different stages. And this is this, the most basic form uh, that we've put together. The importance here is um, of having a reliable, consistent, and an accurate assay is crucial for all these stages. Good assays lead to better trial design uh, and improved chances of patient selection, market success, and most importantly, delivering the right diagnosis and prognosis to the patient. Unnecessary variability can at best lead to more time and cost to get something through and at worst can result in the program failing. So how can we resolve these issues and how and these challenges? Some of the challenges associated with standardization can be resolved by firstly understanding each step in the IFC workflow, that is the analytical sensitivity and specificity of the assays, which includes the antibodies, the antigen retrieval methods, and all the various points that we just discussed. Incorporating precisely defined reference standards as external control for routine monitoring, optimization, and validation is necessary right from the beginning, even at that early stage of the assay development in your lab, because what you do there at that stage impacts everything else. Um, new technologies such as quantitative digital pathology can provide a quantitative, reproducible, and standardized assessment for all these different stages of development, so a combination of uh, monitoring and using different techniques to monitor is your assay performing is crucial. Martin will present image analysis data now on CIQC scored tissue samples and Horizon's reference standards and demonstrate concordance between manual and automated scoring using the Zupan software. In, the, in addition, this data will highlight concordance between Horizon cell line reference standards and tissue control staining. Martin, here you go. Well, thank you very much, Farah. And uh, as Farah mentioned, what I'll be presenting are some uh, data that we've been uh, so lucky to uh, be invited to, to analyze by the CIQC. 
and uh, we'll be uh, showing or demonstrating the effects of using uh, reference standards and image analysis to do EQA uh, work on a run conducted by the CIQC for BRAF V1600 on colorectal cancer. So in this uh, run by the CIQC, they received a lot of uh, samples or a lot of images from uh, various laboratories who had uh, stained tissue samples provided by the CIQC with different platforms. So we both have Antenna, Leica and all sorts of platforms covered. And the CIQC then blindly reviews and scores these uh, tissue samples by six individual assessors manually. And doing so, of course, is a quite long task and takes some time. So apart from just doing the assessment, the CIQC also selects viable human samples to perform this testing. And alongside those human samples, Horizon have added their IHC reference standards. So the goal, of course, for this study was to develop an image analysis algorithm that could analyze the selected human samples that CIQC had found and calculate scores so we could compare our automated algorithms to the CIQC readings. As a secondary goal, we wanted to show that the IHC reference standards from Horizon could be analyzed with the same methods and scores calculated on those reference standards could be used as a quality measure alongside uh, the CIQC readings. So all of this uh, is built into one TMA layout which is uh, placed on each of the images sent to uh, the laboratories, or sorry, each of the samples sent to laboratories. So on, on one part we have the CIQC human samples consisting about 41 um, TMA cores, whereof two of them had a high dropout rate, so they were more or less excluded from this study. And on the other end of the, um, on the slides, we have the IIT reference standards from Horizon, demonstrating a good variation of both negative and positive for both of these uh, sets. And just to pull out a real example of how these images look like, we have the CIQC samples again in the bottom right, where we can see that there are a lot of different cores with varying degree of intensity. Uh, some of them are even cut up or torn, uh, ripped to pieces. And then you have the Horizon IHC uh, reference standards on the left, where you have all of these uh, dots representing the cell lines, where you do not have the same tear and rip off, uh, but still you, you have a lot of, of tissue to look at or a lot of uh, cells to look at. So the challenge for us, of course, is to create something that can handle both cases and will be able to do an equally good analysis on both of these, even though there is variation. So the first thing we did was to pick out the uh, CIQC human samples and then try to develop an algorithm to prove uh, that we could develop an algorithm that would be able to reproduce the scores delivered by the CIQC. So if we take a closer look, we can see that there are various uh, negative and positive cores distributed throughout the door. Uh, the negative cores are highlighted green, the positive ones are highlighted uh, red, and of course the ones that are excluded due to a high dropout rate are uh, circled with a, a yellow uh, circle. And apart from this setup, we should note that core number 19, which I'll highlight a few times throughout this uh, presentation, is quite ideal for a weak positive control. So the first part of the image analysis, of course, is to detect the relevant areas. And then we want to calculate some kind of score that can represent the positivity of a single uh, TMA core. And for this, we use the uh, H-score, uh, which I'll come into more detail on later. When we've calculated the H-score for each of the TMAs, we create what we call a uh, Staining profile more or less tells you the reactivity achieved each of the cores, and we can compare those profiles calculated by our algorithms to the profiles created by the CIQC. So in the CIQC evaluation, they give a quite good table over um, how the different cores have reacted, if they are negative and if they are positive. And if we look at a single lab, which are the top rows, we'll see that the individual lab's profile for the TMA course is shown in uh, a single column. And what CIQC does is they actually translate this profile of a lab into a quality score of either uh, suboptimal, adequate, or optimal. 
And recently, uh, I've been told by um, CIQC, they are discussing using a borderline category as well, which lies in between suboptimal and adequate. Uh, but this category is quite difficult um, to place in, in the scoring scheme, and it's not easy to quantify uh, using the manual assessments. So the big question, of course, is can image analysis be used to reproduce this scheme or at least assist the uh, assessors from CIQC in, in doing an easy reproduction of these schemes? So as I said, the first part of the job for us is to create an algorithm that will find the areas of relevant. Uh, it's not all parts that are equally relevant, and we want to exclude those parts automatically. The less manual interaction, the better. So what we use here is a simple pattern recognition that will go in and detect all of the positive and the negative areas that are relevant to work on later. Once we've found those relevant areas, we highlight them using a region of interest, in this case the blue line, and of course we exclude the holes using these uh, black lines. And then we go into a closer detail level to find all of the positive and negative nuclei, separate the nuclei and their cytoplasm, and then we split these detected uh, cells based on the cytoplasm into an either a negative category, weak positive, medium positive, or strong positive. And we can combine these four categories into an H-score. So once we've calculated the H-score, we can take all of the cores from a laboratory. In this case, we can use uh, the only optimal laboratory that was in the study, uh, laboratory 193, and arrange the cores from lowest reacting core to highest reacting core. And by doing so, we would hope, and this is luckily the case, that all of the negative cores have a fairly low H core, whereas all of the positive cores have a higher H core. So we could use this optimal performing lab as a reference to uh, calculate some of the other parameters that we need to derive the quality scores uh, that CIQC also derived. So the first thing that you should notice is this low reacting positive, con uh, positive core, core number 19, where you can see that there's a slight increase, it's not much, but there is a slight increase in the H score of this core number 19. So this profile or these varying reactions of H score is what we use to compare to the readings uh, performed by the CIQC. Um, and calculate a percent agreement, which we can translate into a quality score, which I'll show you in just a minute. But based on the H-score reactions, we can also calculate when the image analysis should say a core is positive and when it is negative. So when we calculate these cutoff points, we can also create a, a sort of a, a false category called an intermediate category. It's not something that's normally used in the BRAF assessment, but when we're trying to quantify quality, having an intermediate category where uh, insufficient stains or uh, two weakly stained um, cores can end up in is quite important, and you'll see that on the next slide. But what we also notice is that the cutoff line from the negative to the intermediate group just cuts off core number 19, which means core number 19 is placed in the intermediate group. It's still positive, but it's not strong positive. All of the remainder of the cores are, of course, positive. So this is an optimal lab, which clearly shows the development of these cores. Now, if we show the same order of uh, TMA cores, but for two other labs, which are suboptimal and adequate, you can see that the negative cores, or those cores that should be negative, are not always negative according to the calculated H score. And what we also see is the, the weak positive core, at least for the suboptimal laboratory, is actually so weak that it's deemed uh, negative. And many of the positive cores are likewise put into an intermediate group or even a negative group, which means that you'll have a very low specificity and sensitivity in the case of a suboptimal uh, laboratory. With an adequate laboratory, you'll notice that you have a slight overreaction of some of the weaker samples. We also see this in core number 19, which is pulled up from this intermediate category into the strong positive category. And when you have this slightly stronger reaction, you can also see that some of the negative cores are actually reacting more, whereby they're pulled up into the intermediate or positive 
um, category. And all of this is probably due to a high background staining. So when we take each of these profiles and compare it to the expected profile, uh, in this case we use the optimal laboratory, which is 193, as the optimal one, and we use the profile defined by the CIQC. And when we compare those, uh, the cores that the computer says are negative and positive and the cores that CIQC says are negative and positive, we get a certain percent agreement. And when we have the percent agreement for all of these laboratories, we can go back and calculate the cutoffs for when a certain percent of agreement is deemed adequate, suboptimal, or optimal. And doing so, we can say that all laboratory profiles who have a percent agreement above 90% are optimally stained. All laboratories with a percent agreement above 55% are adequate. And when we also are considering to introduce this borderline category, which at the moment is quite hard to, uh, to place, we could consider setting in a, a portion of this adequate category going from 55% to 65% that would be borderline. So using these cutoffs we can see that we can successfully, I might add, convert these quality scores or convert these uh, percent agreements into quality scores that match very, very well with the scores from the CIQC. So Farah, I'll leave it back to you. Thanks, Martin. So, um, one of the things we wanted to discuss next is how do we manufacture the cell lines that, uh, that at Horizon? Because, one, as Martin mentioned, these cell lines, these defined cell lines, were used uh, alongside tissue samples in the CIQC run. So, what we do is we take a cell line, a wild type cell line for the mutation of interest, and single cell dilute it to create a clonal cell cell line population. Using Horizon's proprietary gene editing technology, the line is then targeted to create a clonal mutant cell line containing the mutation or translocation of interest. In this case, BRAP V600E. So BRAP V600E, the SNP, was introduced in this wild type cell line. This results in uh, is that you have a pair of isogenic cell lines which are then highly characterized using SNP6 to confirm the cell line in identity. You have Sanger sequencing to check the engineering event was correct digital PCR to check the allelic frequency and expression of the transcript, and finally the IHC assay and characterization to check if your staining pattern was correct. So the all cell lines go through this rigorous uh, level of uh, characterization and validation. Once we did this, so we identified, uh, we sent CIQC four cell lines. We sent them a negative, two intermediates, and a positive cell line. Once the IQC received these cell lines, they themselves of, uh, quality controlled it in their laboratories. And uh, as per our staining patterns, there was a, a full concordance between theirs and ours. So they identified the negative, intermediate, and strong, as you can see on the right-hand side. Once this was done, they uh, constructed the PMAs that Martin showed you earlier on with the tissues and cell lines. And this is what was sent to all the participants. Yes, so as Farah said, we, uh, we now have the cell lines in place as well, which are also stained on the same slide as the human samples, and therefore can characterize the same kind of variation. And since we could uh, successfully calculate a quality score that fitted very well with the CIQC samples on the human uh, cases, the question now arises, can we do the same using cell lines? And with the cell lines, we have the same um, setup as, as with the uh, uh, human samples. We have some that show a negative reaction. We have some that show a positive reaction. But as an addition, we even have some that could show an intermediate reaction, some that would be uh, sustainable to, or some that would be uh, possible to look at this intermediate reaction, which we wouldn't otherwise be able to see with the human samples. Now, the biggest challenge when looking at human samples is to find the area of interest because there may be a huge variation from background to relevant areas and sometimes background may look like the relevant areas. 
the good thing about the IIT reference standards is that there is no area of interest detection to be done. Everything is of interest. So we can completely skip the step where we have to find and eliminate certain parts based on the pattern, and we can go, go directly to the case where we find all of the cells and we separate them into the four same categories based on the cytoplasmic staining. So again, we have the completely negatively stained nuclei being zero, we have the weakly positive nuclei being one plus, medium two plus, and strong ones three plus. And we can combine this into the same age score as before. So for the cell lines, we can use the same basic image analysis algorithm as we could for human samples. What we have to change are some of the cutoffs that we are arriving at in a moment. So if we do the same as we did for uh, the human samples and pull out an optimal laboratory, but this time for the cell lines, we can see again that we have these three cores that should be negative that actually have a fairly low uh, H score, and the rest that should be intermediate and strong have an increasing H score. So based on this, we can again calculate the positive and intermediate uh, cutoff that we can use to separate the categories and use to identify the different cell line cores. And what we can see here is that we can clearly identify all of the negative ones and we can clearly identify all of the positive ones just as we could with the CIQC human samples. Now if we do the same for a suboptimal laboratory or an adequate laboratory, we can see the same kind of behavior. For suboptimal laboratories, you have a slight overstaining, uh, which causes all of the negative samples to rise up into the intermediate area, um, but it also causes many of the positive uh, samples to lower themselves into the intermediate area, um, at least according to the calculated age score. So again, this has a very poor uh, sensitivity and specificity, just as we had before with the human samples. For the adequate laboratory, we can preserve the number of negative samples, but we can clearly see as well that many of the positive samples actually have a lower reaction and they uh, thereby end up being intermediate or even in some cases negative. Even though they're deemed intermediate or negative, there's still a high percentage of the cores that are classified correctly. So we can do the same as we did with the uh, cell lines or with the um, CIQC samples. We take the laboratory profile and we can calculate not based on the CIQC uh, estimation, but based on the genetically designed pattern from Horizon, the percentage agreement. So when they say something is developed to be negative, and we compare it to the uh, H score, does the H score actually support that statement? And when we do that for all of the laboratories, we uh, can then calculate or we can then compare these percent agreements to the quality scores given by the CIQC and calculate some new cutoffs. And the reason why these percent agreements look quite a bit lower than for the human samples is by the simple fact that we have less samples available. Uh, with the CIQC study, we have 41. With the horizon cell lines, we have uh, 12. But nonetheless, when we calculate the uh, quality scores based on these uh, percentages, we can see that everything that has an agreement above 90% is deemed uh, optimal. Everything that has uh, an agreement above 40% is deemed adequate. And using this split, all of the laboratories are classified correctly compared to the CIQC scores. Of course, we can again introduce this optional category called borderline, which is very ill-defined yet, um, but if we had to define it as it is today, we would um, set it to be between 40 and 50 percent agreement. Of course, calculating the correct cutoffs for the borderline category, regardless if you're using cell lines or the human samples, would require additional material and further investigation. But when we have these data from the cell lines and from the human samples, we can collect it all into one big table with a lot of numbers. And looking at this might make you a bit confused, uh, but it allows us to compare the automatically generated scores with the manual uh, scores across the different methods. So if we just put on some color, we can see that all of the green columns 
are the ones where the image analysis or uh, CIQC deemed them to be optimal or adequate. So this means there's 100% accordance between uh, the image analysis and the CIQC scores. And the same applies for the suboptimal category. All the ones that CIQC mentioned to be suboptimal are in fact also deemed suboptimals when using the image analysis both on the human tissues and on the cell lines. So in fact we can use image analysis um, to create uh, quality scores and we could use image analysis as a guiding tool for the six assessors so they wouldn't have to do everything manually but could be helped along the way using a tool like this. We can also see that we do not have to use necessarily hard to get material. It would possibly be it would be possible to select these IHC reference standards and use them together with image analysis to assess the staining quality. Of course, we could consider, as I've said a few times, to introduce this borderline category. And if we try to implement that into today's uh, image analysis and in today's cell lines, uh, we can see that at least for one case, when the computer says uh, that the laboratory is borderline, so does the CIQC. But for one of the other cases, we actually miss uh, both on the uh, tissue samples and on the cell lines that this could be a borderline case. And for two other laboratories, the image analysis deems the laboratory to be borderline, whereas CIQC uh, tells them to be adequate. However, from talking to CIQC, they also mentioned that this is a, a quite new category they're considering to implement, and, and therefore it's not uh, well defined yet. So work could be done to implement uh, this uh, new category. Regardless, there's still a lot of data showing that using image analysis can be a viable way to do EQA work and to assess your staining quality. And I know for a fact that Horizon have also taken this method to them and are using it to assess their own production of uh, reference standards, at least on the ALK production, the ROS1, the EGFR, and the MET with excellent results where we can clearly separate the negative uh, genetically defined cores from the positive and in some cases even detect the category that has been uh, genetically defined to be intermediate. So just to conclude this uh, webinar, uh, I want to invite you all to our next webinar which is uh, building on this theme and this uh, case story which we've conducted together with CIQC and Horizon. And of course, I want to uh, thank everyone who has been participating in this webinar. I want to reach a special thank out to CIQC and John Garrett who have allowed us to join uh, this webinar and have uh, helped us work on the data and understand the data. I want to thank uh, Miguel Rabek from our own company for working on the algorithm side. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Vicky uh, Spivy and Daniel Sutton and of course Farah from Horizon from all joining in and helping on, on this exciting study.